Hi, I'm Peggy Farron, and we are live with the Understand Photography Show, where we talk about travel, nature, and fine art photography. Welcome to episode number 75. Hopefully you are watching us live on Facebook. We are live every Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time on the Understand Photography Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash understand photography. It's a command, so it's understand. There's no ing. Everybody adds an ing to my name. Anyway, <laughs> if, you, if you can't watch us live, we put the show on YouTube on our YouTube channel, the Understand Photography YouTube channel, and also on iTunes as a podcast. So if you're like me and you like to listen to podcasts in the car, you can listen to the Understand Photography Show on iTunes. Just do a search for the Understand Photography Show and you'll find us. Please subscribe. We're on a kind of a kick to try to get more YouTube subscribers right now, so we appreciate it if you subscribe. It really helps us out. Uh, we uh, have the four weeks to proficiency in photography online class which is a, an interactive class it's I'm there with you during the class so it's a it's a series of four classes with homework and a quiz and you've got a teacher who is helping you along the whole time the next one starts February 22nd so next week so hopefully you will join us the cl first class is shoot in manual so you're going to really understand exposure. Remember our motto at Understand Photography is we simplify the technical. So if you're the kind of person who needs things like, I need you to show me, this class is for you because we're going to teach you photography and we're going to show you how to do it on your camera. Okay, so the first class is shoot in manual. The second one is all about composition to create winning images. Third class is all about lighting, including flash photography. And the fourth class is what we call the techie stuff, but you'll be ready for it by the end of the, the class. So that starts February 22nd next week. We have one opening left for our ladies photo retreat here in Naples, Florida, which is May 4th through the 6th. So check that out on our website at understandphotography.com. So for episode number 75, my guest is nature photographer John Slonina. Hi, John. Hi, how are you? Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me here. And it's you, a pleasure. You're, you're from Massachusetts, right? Yes. So you're, you're uh, escaping the cold weather. It is fantastic being down here and avoiding the cold. It's, <laughs> it's terrible up there this time of year, right? Well, I get used to it, but I, I enjoy traveling around and experiencing different temperatures. Yeah. Last, so, last month I was in Yellowstone and it was below zero. And now I'm in Florida in two weeks. I'm in Alaska doing the Northern Lights. Oh my God, you're all over the place. So I could have. You go a... from hot to cold to hot to cold? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's a little confusing. So I could actually experience a 100 degree temperature change between this week and, um, and what's going on a couple in mid March. Oh my gosh. So you got to be prepared for everything. Now, you have been leading photo tours for a long time. But how did you know? Have you been? Were you a professional nature photographer before? How did how did all how did your career happen? And when I was interested, when I was a kid, I used to spend a lot of time hiking and doing day trips with my parents and visiting the national parks. Mm -hmm. And then it, that led to an intense interest in nature and wildlife and exploring different things. So I always wanted to hike in the woods to see what's around the next corner. Okay. And then about um, 25 years ago, I get this super passion to try to do it for a living. So I started off with a full-time job and doing it on a part-time basis. And then that gradually became a, a full-time business for the last 10 years. Wow. So you just started, was it photography tours you started with? or um, I actually did a whole bunch of different things. I did leading groups for camera clubs and Audubon groups and bird watching walks okay. and all kinds of things. And then it gradually became, um, I was really involved with a fine art uh, gallery, art show type living in then. And my interest was always being out in the field. Okay, you didn't want to be stuck in a tent on every, every weekend, huh? Exactly. <laughs> so I, I basically wanted to get out. I enjoyed meeting with people. And, um, and I just wanted to, I, my passion was not only photographing, but showing people nature. Okay. Because a lot of wonderful things happen, and it's really fun to show somebody their first volcano or their first wolf or whatever comes about it. I've never seen a wolf. <laughs> Have I ever seen? No, I've never seen a volcano either. <laughs> it's it's weird. The more some of the things I'm really lucky to be able to do what I do, but um, 
sometimes you can see things hundreds of times and I, it thrills me every time. Like alligators down here, right? I love the alligators. Who gets sick of alligators? How could you get sick of seeing alligators? They're so, they're so cool. Right? I love Florida. Yeah. Now, you just finished two eight-day workshops in Florida, right? Yes. It was a blast. Um, there is so many quality, wonderful places to go in Florida. Like, I spent a lot of time in the Everglades, Big Cypress Preserve, um, over in the Delray Beach area for Wakota Hatchie Wetlands, Sanibel Island. Oh, um, you know what? I got to stop you because I forgot on my commercial in the beginning. We have, I think, one opening left for our Wakota Hatchie day trip. If anybody's from Southwest Florida, I want to, maybe two. I don't know. I know we have three Lindas going. <laughs> Isn't that I, funny? I know it's But Wakota Hatchie is when, next Wednesday or Thursday, February 21 or 22. Wednesday. Wednesday. February, I thought somebody might tell me, 21, I think. <laughs> That's on our website, understandphotography.com. Okay, I'm sorry. Well, it's okay. a great place. And then also I spent time in the um, Cape Canaveral area visiting numerous owl and eagle nests and manatees. And how can you go wrong in this state? It's so gorgeous. I, I love Florida. I, I truly think Florida is paradise. It's, it's just such a beautiful state. Well, you know, that's why I start. You are a great example of why I started this show as a Facebook Live show because I look and all these big famous photographers, they all come to Florida. <laughs> exactly. I thought, well, how can I take advantage of this? And, 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 and that's how I found you. I, I, well, I knew who you were, and I was like, I wonder when he's coming to Florida, and I'm going to try to get him on the show. I know. So, I was thrilled to be here. Even the 16 days I spent, I don't think we hit the same area twice. Okay, so what's the last one? The last eight days, what would you do? Um, I started with a group in the Sarasota area, and we went out to some pelican rookeries, and we uh. went out to Fort DeSoto. Um, Mayaka River State Park for the alligators, reptiles, and birds. Okay. And we went out to some owl and eagle nests. Then we went into Lakeland and we visited a couple of areas around there. Okay. And then we ended up in Titusville and explored like Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge. Wow. So now, how many people go on one of your tours? I usually have a group size of no more than six to eight. And you do you rent a van? Yes. Because you're making a lot of progress there. Yeah, well, I prefer everybody in the same group okay. because when you have a big group and everybody's driving separately, yeah. it's it's a good for group dynamics. It's better to have them together. Yeah, I and agree. also if you have a wildlife sighting, like I've seen tours in Yellowstone where I have everybody in one van, and then I see another tour go by, that might have six or seven cars following each other, and then if there's a grizzly bear in, on the road, it's impossible to get everybody out and get their gear out. Yeah. And then try to get the shot. And, and also some national parks, you might go to a secret waterfall and they might only have room for one car. Oh. So, so it's good to have, um, I like keeping everybody together. Yeah, I think that's I can't do it every tour, but I do it almost every one. Yeah. And just rent a van, that's what you do? Right. And I also own a, a 12 passenger van. Oh, for when you start up in your yes. area. <laughs> I fly out to Florida just because I'm on the road a lot. Yeah. But but the, um, That's what we did. We bought a van here. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's, it's much easier. It's a good move. Yeah, yeah. A yeah. lot of driving, but it's a good move. <laughs> yeah, it's fun having a van, too. <laughs> now, our topic today is hot spots, nature, great nature hot spots in the United States, but why don't we start in Florida? So sure. let's start here in southwest Florida. We'll see if I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> the... Um, I, the way I look at the winter in the U.S. is you have two choices, okay. two major choices. If you like the cold, mm -hmm. I highly recommend Yellowstone in the winter with the wolves and all. They go by snow coach and by car and travel to different parts of the park. Are that, is, now, is that where you see those foxes that dive into the snow? Exactly. That's at Yellowstone And mostly? the wolves and bison covered in frost and snow-capped mountains. It's just wonderful in the winter. Oh, it's wow. a winter wonderland. And if you don't like the cold, another place I would consider just as good as Yellowstone, if not better, is Florida. So for somebody who lives in the U.S., there's numerous choices here. 
Like oh, for instance, well, the U.S. is humongous. Yeah. Like now, that. are most of your tours based in the United States? Everyone. Oh, you don't go to Italy and Tuscany and all that like all the other guys. <laughs> there, there's a specific reason why. Is is when I'm in the U.S., I'm comfortable. Mm -hmm. If somebody sees an animal or a beautiful landscape or a logistical issue, I know what I'm doing. And if I was doing a tour to a foreign country, it's not my area of comfort. Yeah. I, I have a rule that if I lead a tour, I know the wildlife, the area, okay. the landscapes, and the logistics, and the okay. ecology of that area. So if I was doing a tour, say, Costa Rica, that's, that would be an absolutely wonderful place, but it's not something I know a lot about. Right. I know. Well, that's why we do most of our stuff right here in southwest Florida, because, of course, we've got the Everglades. We're so lucky. <laughs> we got all the birds, and we don't have to go too far, but, you know, we know the area so well. So what, what about best, let's do best nature hotspots in Florida. Don't sure. give me such a big, <laughs> big thing. Not Florida. I need you to narrow it down. <laughs> <laughs> if I did get real specific, my favorite is probably the Everglades. Okay. And the Big Cypress Preserve. Where do you go in Big, Big Cypress? Do you uh, specific? Following the Loop Roads and Jade Scenic Drive and, and places like that. And what do you like see? That. Okay, so let's say you're going down Loop Road. And Loop Road, for those of you who don't know, if you go down US 41, which is called the Tamiami Trail, goes from Naples to Miami. Actually, it goes from Tampa to Miami. That's why it's called Tamiami, Tampa to Miami. <laughs> anyway, but from Naples to Miami, it, it cuts through the Air Everglades. And Loop Road, it goes off to the south of 41, and then it loops around and comes back to 41. That's why they call it Loop, so it loops around. So what's good about Loop Road? The reason I like it is um, a lot of places in Florida, you can get a lot of full-frame animals and wading birds. Well, when I'm on the loop road, I like blending the animals in the environment. Oh, okay. Where you could get a big cypress tree and a reflection and the spoonbill peeking around the tree. Okay. I, can't, I really love doing full frame animals, but I'm very passionate about animals in the environment also. Oh, okay. So what the loop road allows you to do is to do like a Clyde Butcher type setup where you get the big cypress trees and the reflections. And now, then, do you take and your people animals. actually into the swamp, or do you just park on the side? Um, no, I've been into the swamp myself up to but waist the people, high. But, but you don't take your people. Not during my tour. I don't think that's be very Because that's the same popular. with us. I love doing that, but I, none of, so far I haven't had any, no one has ever asked me to go in. <laughs> I don't think there's much of a demand. And they're it's too, too bad. They're scared. They're I would scared love of the to, I would love to, but I, I've Well, yet. next time you come, plan more time and we'll go out. Yeah, that would be fun. <laughs> I, I love that. I, it's fun. I hey, you know what the creepiest thing about being in the water is? When you're walking through the water and you're moving through the swamp and it's waist high and you kick a log. And you don't know what it and is. And you don't know what it is. <laughs> so you're wondering if it's some type of snake or alligator. <laughs> and it always freaks me out. I would rather see the alligator in front of me than have something bump my leg and wonder what it was. Yeah, I never had anybody. I've kicked stumps, but I knew there were stumps because they were so hard. But the thing that I don't like is when you fall in a hole. Yeah. Because you use that wa walk, of course, a walking stick, but still, you, there's a I lot of holes. I was using my tripod, but carried all the expensive photo gear. It's one step at a time. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, we use dry bags, because you know we're gonna fall. Yeah. <laughs> we know we're gonna fall in. So. But, but Florida is incredibly special. Like I said, I went for 16 days total, and I could probably do another 10 and not cover the and same area here. twice. Well, yeah, we could do that right in the Everglades. Right in this, within so, so Loop 20 Road miles is, here. do you have like, because uh, Loop Road has different, like it's very wooded. First it's kind of prairie-ish, yep. and then it's very wooded. The, um, do you have like favorite spots through there? Yeah, I like where the culverts intersect with the road. Oh, okay. And then when you stop at each spot, you have your own alligators and uh, waiting birds. I got birds. my best alligator shot there. On Loop Road, about 12 miles in. I mean, it's a. I think it's a 24 mile. 24 miles. Is it 24? Okay, yeah. And then the road across the street with the bird on loop, and I believe it's Wagon Wheel Road. I don't know that one. But um, that's another good one too. But uh, what I like about that road is you can combine landscape with wildlife, uh -huh. or do one or the other, because on the as you know on the Loop Road, in the beginning and the end, there's a lot of opportunities for landscape photography. So if you could go down the road and then towards sunrise or sunset, 
start off with some storm clouds coming over, you know, some of the, um, the dwarf cypress trees and things like that. It's pretty phenomenal. We don't get a lot of clouds in the, in the, in the winter, though, when you're here, right? <laughs> You've got to come in the summer. <laughs> Nobody wants to come to it's Florida true. in the it's summer, It's true. It's not though. as uh, stormy <laughs> Those or Clyde Butcher things, I think, are all done in the summer because those clouds are amazing. Well, that's why Florida has, the, isn't it the record for the most thunderstorms yeah. in the summer? Oh, is it? I didn't even know I don't know, know if it's the world or the U.S., but, but it definitely But we have thunderstorms a... pretty much every day in the summer, but just it's only like an hour. It's not like a big deal at all. It's yeah. mostly it's mostly beautiful, and then it just rains for a little while. It cools it off a little, and it's nice. But the sunsets are amazing in the summer. In the winter, they're they're okay, <laughs> you know. But we don't. But then all the people come in the in the winter. All right. So Loop Road, Jane Scenic Drive, Wagon Wheel. Yeah, and the those bird, are I, yeah, the Bird on Loop. I think's the name of it. And then of course Shock Valley, which I have my New England accent. Everyone laughs at the way I pronounce it. Shock. Yeah. Shark. There's an <laughs> R in there. <laughs> exactly. Um, but it, anyways, it's pretty cool out there, and I love the other end of the Everglades. Like way down south. You yes. Mean. Headed down from the Inhinga Trail all the way out to Flamingo. Okay. And then I love, like, even in the Flamingo area with some of the osprey nests and um, some occasional spoonbills, and I love the manatees and the saltwater crocodile. I have never seen a crocodile. It's, it, uh, I know there's one right at Marsh Trail in the Everglades, the closest place to us right here in the Everglades. There's a crocodile, but I've never seen it. Yeah, they're much bigger. They look a lot different. And um, one year there was a crocodile that died a few years ago, but he was going to Sanibel Island, and he would lay down. They usually prefer a saltwater environment, but he would lay down on the freshwater side. And then, and then the alligators that lived on the freshwater side went over on the saltwater side oh, of the island they didn't to want avoid to the crocodile. Oh, oh my God! Because you got to show the crocodiles a little more respect. They're bigger. They're meaner, and, right? Yeah, I don't meaner? know if I use the word meaner, but they're they're um, they have more potential of. Where they're more aggressive in general. Bigger, I think, yes. right? Yeah, because alligators. Now, let me admit, if I have to walk around the mouth of an alligator, I am scared, but I know they're probably gonna leave me alone, where I think I'd be afraid to do that with a crocodile. <laughs> the key with all those animals is they can outrun you, but, if, but they can only run about 10, 12 feet. I wouldn't pull out measuring tape and say, <laughs> okay, I have 12 feet and lay on the ground and assume he couldn't go after you, but, um, but usually a, a wide distance. Uh. And then it's like bears. Everybody hears all the horror stories. Yeah. And then they don't talk about the millions of people that you know that are out around bears every day yeah do you know bill lee yes he was on the show and he is passionate about bears and he's like they're they're just like big dogs they're so nice I like but it's know. it's but i'm on the road a lot and then after florida um in march i go f to alaska for the northern lights oh wow and for anybody who photographs the northern lights march in September, if you look at data, is the, it, basically it's the time when the Earth's atmosphere is at its weakest. Okay. So you have the highest probability of seeing the Northern Lights in March ah, and September, in, no matter where you are in the world. No matter where you are, so all those people go to Iceland, they should probably go in March or right. in September. Exactly. Ah. So, th th so that brings up a choice for me. When we're in Fairbanks and up and around that area, within okay. 100 miles of Fairbanks, we're right under the Aurora Belt. Okay. And because my choice is a March in September, if you look at the data on top of that, September is the cloudiest month of the year. So September is not the best time to go. Right. It, I mean, you, the Northern Lights might be going on, but you're going to be looking at the you clouds. Won't see them. You might see a green cloud. And then in, on average, in March, the um, for the Northern Lights, we get an average. The, the state of Alaska gets an average of one to two cloudy nights all month long. Wow! So you get so out of the that's the best time to go. Right. Period. So out of, it's cold, but out, out of the last five or six years, and me being up there counting the time I'm scouting, probably a couple weeks a year, I've missed the Northern Lights. One year we had a storm that hung out for three days, but I missed the Northern Lights counting that 
four or five times out of a hundred nights. Wow, that's awesome. So March is the time. Now, is that the best place to see the Northern Lights in Alaska, do you think? In well, the United States? In or the, in general? In the United States, definitely. Because the aurora belts right under you. I mean, right above your head. So okay. that's like a big circle, oval-shaped thing that moves. Okay. And then when it's over your head, you get a really high probability of seeing it. Oh. And for in other places that would be under the belt would be like Churchill, Manitoba. I think Iceland and Norway are. I, it's so funny. I never really, I guess because Iceland is, seems like everybody's going there for the last few years. My son went to Iceland on his honeymoon. Yeah. And uh, I'm like, what? So I never really thought about the northern lights because I don't like to be cold. But I, I rent... It, it, during season, I rent rooms out in my house for three Airbnb, and I got a lady staying right now from Northern Michigan, and she's like, "Oh, we see the Northern Lights in Michigan." I'm from Michigan. I didn't know that, but not from Northern Michigan. I'm from Detroit. right there. Um, it I would say f during a good year, they're probably able to see the Northern Lights ten, twelve nights a year. Okay. Same thing with New England. The farther you go north, the more you are towards the belt. You're not under it. But you occasionally could see it. Okay, and I so know So somebody I had in Northern guest. Maine in New Hampshire, they might have a shot at it. And then basically, the farther you go north, the more the probability. Yeah, because another guy who was on the show uh, was Montana, I think, and he said, "I didn't know you could see them." <laughs> He's like, "I was so excited, and we ran to the town to tell everybody, and they're like, big deal." <laughs> exactly. I mean, to, to the average person. The, but if you don't want to get a passport and want to stay in the United States, Alaska is the place to go. And is Fairbanks the place to go in yes, Alaska? And why? Statistically, since Fairbanks is under the, the Aurora belt, there's an 80%. The, the Fairbanks website claims there's an 80% chance to see that ah, if you're there three nights or more. In March. And, that's, and that's on average. In March, it'd be even higher. Oh, okay. And then when you jump in from Fairbanks to Denali, it jumps down to like 50, 60 percent. Oh. And even Anchorage is like a 40 percent chance. Okay, so fair. So, I mean, I'd rather be in Anchorage. So than, what else do you do on your Africa or Alaska trip? You go at, out at night to photograph. The, but night is early, right? Uh, we go out at like 9. That trip's different, uh, at least for the Aurora trip. We're out at... Nine ten o'clock at night to two three o'clock in the morning. Okay. And then the next day we do activities like somebody could go dog sledding or Fairbanks has a an ice carving championship where people from all over the world compete. Oh well, that sounds cool. So that's a lot of fun, but the whole year in the U.S. is of amazing. April um, peak time for for waterfalls, wildflowers. Uh, dogwood trees. So are where do you go in April? Smoky Mountains. Oh yeah, that's that's another Bill Lee place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, a lot of black bears coming out of the den, and then um, and I do see Bill Lee there. I like him a lot. Is it really crowded in April though? The, no, it's um, when does it that because that gets really crowded. It's in the weird. Summer? The um, in April the hotel where I stay at, she calls a photographer month. Is it's when all the photo tours are down there is in April. Oh, because, because that's it's such the best. an ideal time of year. Ah. And then for me, I spend a lot of time working the black bears and the cubs. So that's when they're first starting to come out of the den. Oh, so it's a wonderful okay. time of year. And then I then in May I go into the southwest, which is April and May is a really good time to be in the southwest. And why is that? It's not too hot. Oh, yeah, because it gets hot. Or snowy, believe it or not. Oh, that's right. I, I would like the snow, don't get me wrong. But the um, it's a good time of year. And then I go to a lot of the national parks. I recommend the shoulder season before peak traffic. Okay. So. And then for like Yellowstone, for example, I enjoy the month of May into June. Okay. Because you, all the mountains are snow-capped in Yellowstone and Grand Tetons. And then all the baby animals are out. Oh. And then the predators are out and the wildflowers are in bloom. Oh, my goodness. And if you go in July, lots of traffic, warmer temperatures, less wildlife. Yeah, because it's too hot. They're... And on the, other, on the flip side, if you go in September, especially after Labor Day weekend, the crowds are gone, fall color is coming in, oh. and the animals have this thick fur coat, and then the rut's going on. So we could actually drive through um, 
through Yellowstone and, and see elk and bison and pronghorn and the and the elk and the moose are a lot of times fighting and sparring. Oh my god. So that's a thrill. How and far it, away are you when you're photographing them though? It's, That'd be scary. It's long okay. we're, we're super <laughs> careful. And then the um, another example is the Yellowstone. Sometimes when the elk are in the rut and people drive through the town of Mammoth Sometimes you um, you see them charge the cars, and there's always a photographer that's trying to get that last shot. And the range is like movie car, movie car, and then they and a lot of times certain elks will hit the cars. Oh my god! So you got to be really careful. But I gotta admit, it's kind of fun to watch. As long hear, as it's not your car. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, mean, I think it's the best lunch break in the world. <laughs> I take my group and we watch it from the distance. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but it, it's crazy. interesting. And, it, and it's fun. We film videos of it. It's just, it's a lot of fun. Wow. As long as, it, like you said, as long as it's not my car. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. That'd be so scary. And then I spend my summers um, in June and July, I spend it on the main coast. Uh, guess where I'm going this July? Perfect. I'm going to, up, I told you, to Massachusetts, and then we're going to Acadia. I've never been to Acadia National I love Park. Acadia. Good. It's just a beautiful place. I, although I better get my butt going because I don't have a place to stay yet, and that's peak season for them, right? Peak season for Acadia is probably the last weekend in June up to Labor Day weekend. Yeah, and I'll be there in July. Yeah, so that's definitely peak season. I better kick season. it into gear. <laughs> yeah, I would look into this hotel. If anybody knows a good it? place to stay in Acadia, let me know. <laughs> I or nearby. You, I can give you a list later. Okay. And then the, uh, what else? And then I do side trips out to photograph the puffins. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Let's slow down. Sure. Okay, so let's talk about Maine in June. What do you, what do you photograph? Do you go to Acadia? Is that where you go? Yes. Oh, okay. I do a tour in Acadia. Now, what's so good about Acadia? Why do all the photographers go there? It's incredible ocean landscapes. Okay. So you can literally get up um, and photograph, like drive up Cadillac Mountain, and then see the sun rising. And you could go, um, you could go paddling up by a kayak and, and and enjoy the ocean environment. You could take a walk in downtown Bar Harbor, which has great restaurants and different things like that. But a lot of real coastal beauty. Is the mountains and the rocky coast? Okay. Maine, Massachusetts, for instance, has a really sandy coast. Okay. With sand dunes, which is really nice in a different way. Yeah. But when you get up to Maine, it's more rocky, um, not as many sand dunes, and it's a more rugged coastline. And then I just love Maine because you can sit there by the ocean, and um, and watch the waves come in and a sailboat go by, or stand in an old fishing harbor. And then drive two hours or three hours into the middle of nowhere where it's heavily wooded and you might have a shot of seeing a moose. Oh, There's wow. just so many different things to do in Maine. And I, a lot of beautiful lighthouses. Yeah, I saw. There's some lighthouses right in Acadia, right? There's one. Oh, one, okay. But it, uh, there's several on the southern Maine What's coast. What's your favorite spot in Acadia so I don't miss it? Um, Ocean Drive. Ocean Drive. And then basically it's it's a path that runs parallel to the ocean. Oh. And then so if you're there at sunrise, you can literally just walk down the path and go out on the rocks and change your foregrounds. Oh. I could spend a week just on Ocean Drive. Okay. So if you shoot one morning in one place, and then I recommend go back and then, um, and then go down the road 300 yards or half a mile down the road and check out a whole different foreground. Okay. And then if everything cooperates, it's pretty amazing. What I like to do is get the group up early and silhouette the trees as the sun's rising. Oh. And then shoot the, the morning light. And, and it's just so many things. And there's a lot of carriage paths that you can walk for miles. Oh, wow. Oh, and Acadia nice. is really special. Oh, that's exciting. Anywhere else in Maine that you like? Yeah, I drive like two. I have another trip where we stay in Lebec, Maine. And then we... Um, it's right at the tip of the main coast. Oh, okay. And then we're right near Campobello Island. So we could go out into Canada and play around in that area. And then we, I like to do a whale watch out of there. Oh. So you could, you could go out at sunset and photograph the Canadian lighthouses. And from the boat? Or from the boat. Okay. And on land. Do you, so you need a passport to go on that one? Oh, uh, yes. Okay. And then we, uh, and we also do a couple... 
uh, charted boats out to photograph the puffins. And that's from the northern tip of Maine? Correct. Oh. About two hours north of Acadia. Wow. So it's a really wonderful area. And what's interesting about it is where, since we're so far up the coast, we're out of the tourist loop. So I can go in there on July 4th weekend, the most crowded travel weekend of the year from the main coast, and then have the place almost essentially to uh, a limited amount of people. Oh my gosh. We might end up having to do that if I can't find a place to stay in Acadia. <laughs> no, you will. I can give you a list of hotels. Because I just realized it's... Because I'm speaking at the um, Northeast NECCC. Oh, wow. What does that stand for? New England Camera Club New Conference. England. New England Camera Club Conference. I don't know why I had a, I just had a blind spot in my brain. So that's July 13th through the 15th. It's the weekend after 4th of July. I'll yeah, be the, there also. Oh, good. So, and then from there... That's where, so we'll be going to Acadia like the 16th or whatever that Monday, Tuesday is, so. Yeah, I can send you an email with a bunch of suggestions. Oh, I'm going to, now you're, you're I, I won't let you forget because i got to get to it. And I also send suggestions to people that are going to Acadia what to shoot on the way up. Because if you fly in and just go to Acadia for a few days, you could drive an hour south and be in Stonington Harbor or drive two hours north and go into Lebec, what I was just talking about, okay. and really maximize the trip. Or you could spend three hours driving inland and go to a place like Moosehead Lake or Baxter State Park or Rangeley. The, the options are unlimited. It's beautiful, huh? The only thing to be careful is if you do inland Maine in June, that's their black fly season. Oh, I've heard of them. I know yeah. Joe is from Philadelphia, and he somebody said something about black flies, and they had this big conversation about I don't know what they are. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> it's, <laughs> let's just say it's buggy. Oh, and they bite, right, or sting or something? Or? I never have a problem with them, but, the, uh, but they're just annoying. Okay. okay. So, and when is that? Um, that's in the month of June. It usually peaks. Okay. And it sometimes goes into the first week of July. Hopefully they'll be gone by the time I get up there. It's not a huge problem on the coast, but on inland Maine, it's just something to keep in the back of your mind. Okay. Not enough that you shouldn't go there or anything like that. It's But it's, they're annoying. Okay. I mean, we got bugs in Florida. <laughs> yeah, you're used to it. Used I got to... bug jacket. I'm, you know, I'm living, fl I live in yeah, the Everglades. Yeah, <laughs> I was just saying, when, I'm in the, when I go to Florida this time of year, uh, the only place we get bit is a little bit of the flamingo area. I was going to say, flamingo is like the worst place for mosquitoes. But other than that, I don't think we get bit at no, all. Everybody bad. flies down bug spray, and I send an email, don't bring the bug spray, but everybody does. Yeah, because the rumors are true, and if you come here in the summer... It must be horrible. I tell you, in the <laughs> Everglades, it's bad, although sometimes it's not. It's weird. You just never know. Yeah, it's same thing in, in other places. Sometimes it's like the breeze. Or the amount I don't of rainfall know. and the yeah. breeze in the air and all yeah. that. Yeah. All right, so we're in Florida in the winter. And in March, we're in Alaska for the Northern Lights. I forgot where we go to April. April, Smoky Mountains. Smoky Mountains because of the spring flowers and the wildlife babies. Yes. May. May, I'm in Utah and also Yellowstone. I'm in Yellowstone at Grand Tetons three times a year, January, May, and September. Oh, wow. And then you think June is Maine. June and July, I, I would recommend Maine. Or um, there's other national parks that, that have issues with snow, that the snow is gone that time of year. Like where? Um, for instance, Mount Rainier okay. or Glacier National Park. Oh. So they might be snowed out other times of year, but in the in the middle of the summer, you have a good chance time. of not too much snow. It's yeah, still going to be snow though. Because these people, you could go to do the go into the sunrise road at Glacier in June. I don't do any tours there, so I don't know it that well. But um, you could go there in June, and it, the road could be snowed in. And the same thing. Where is Mount, that? I in, don't know where that is. In Montana, and also wow. uh, Mount Rainier, same thing. Well, I just try to mention all different places. Yeah, no, that's not because it sounds like I'm doing a big sales pitch for my tours. No, oh, yeah, and yeah, I'm really, yeah. <laughs> and I'm really not trying to. It's just that all the places I know really well. Well, you've been doing the tours is, for is, 10 years full time, so you yeah, know where, where to go Yeah, I guess where I go when. on my vacations and all that. And how many places. tours a year do you do? I think about 15 or so. Wow, that's a lot for oh. one person. 
And so I'm on the road at 100, and, and I know other nature photographers that are a lot more. It's not really a complaint, but I'm on the road 140 nights a year. Wow, that's a lot. Approximately. That's a lot. And it's actually, I work every day. Because when you're home, you're answering emails or doing some type of promotion or, or some form of advertising or booking hotels or what we were talking about earlier, filling out permits for the National Park Service. There's a lot of different things involved with the business. There sure are. Call it hotels, and it's it's not all glamorous. Yeah, it's not like you can just call a hotel one time and say, make a reservation for six rooms or something. you got to back and forth with them. I mean, Joe knows all the Everglades guys by, you know, yeah, they're I good bet. buddies because they, you know, first of all, he goes regularly, but then there's always things, you know. Like the hurricanes really screwed things up for this trip because it did they've got the hurricane you know homeless not homeless well i guess they are homeless the people who lost their homes staying in some of those hotels that that's an important thing to bring up because what i did see at some of the hotels they're still in the hotels because yeah. a lot of people even though their house might not be flooded they're still having problems with mold and all kinds of issues oh, so, a lot of people lost their homes completely my assistant did so, yeah, and mold was a big thing. I was, you know, I had a little bit of flooding, but I came home, and we came home the next day, even though they said, don't come back right away because they didn't want the traffic and all that, but we came and, you know, opened the doors and put the fans on the floor and wiped everything up so I didn't get a mold. But the people who did get mold, they had to tear down their, their they had to tear down their walls to the studs. Yeah, it's crazy. So, yeah, they're homeless for a long time. I just got my roof two weeks ago. Wow. So it's, yeah. Yeah, we felt bad. I mean, the whole country was watching. Yeah. It, was a, was, it hit the whole state. <laughs> yeah, it was like it, nobody knew exactly the exact path. All right, so all right, so we're going to Maine. What about, when, when do I go to Mass? When do I go to Cape Cod since I'm going to Cape Cod? But everybody keeps telling me I'm going at the, it's going to be crazy, crazy, because I'm going to go there like right before the conference. So yeah, like July. You, you, Actually, I'm speaking at the Cape Cod Camera Club. Or oh, excellent. Cape Cod Art Center camera club excellent that's a good group the um what the thing about cape cod in a lot of these places when i mention each place i'm bringing up the ideal time of year uh -huh. but it doesn't mean that you when's sh the ideal time of year to go then i like the shoulder season oh and that like is... may or september just to avoid the crowds it's a little quieter not shoulder as much track season i never heard that term i like that term <laughs> yeah it means it's, it basically avoided all the peak traffic but it's still, the weather's still decent. Like, I actually make a confident, like, a, a real concerted effort to look at each place I go and try to figure out how do I manage the crowds. Yeah. And I mean, you brought up course. an example, Sanibel Island. Like, when I go, I usually know how many traffic problems there is I'm there in the pre-dawn light. Oh, yeah. So there's no traffic on the right. bridge. But if I cruised in there in February in the middle of the day... Well, if you go, at it's like, not going to be a fun trip. No, it's going to kind of take you a couple hours. So, if I told you this story. I'll tell the audience that I, I asked on the Ask Southwest Florida Facebook group, "When's the best time to go over the bridge in Sanibel?" For one of my guests, and somebody put August. <laughs> that <laughs> <Exactly>. was funny. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. If you go like three o'clock in the afternoon, if you're going on to Sanibel, it's okay. But if you want to go any time in the morning, you're yeah, going to wait for a long time. That's And a lot of, just like the other places like Sanibel, though, sometimes you live the back roads. So you so you can get around a lot of the yeah, traffic. There's only one bridge. Yeah. You've got to get over but that, that bridge. bridge. Same thing with Cape Cod. That's what, it's, yeah. It's a, that's the problem. That What's one your bridge. favorite spot to photograph in Cape Cod for landscapes? Because I, I love landscape photography. I like the whole um, Orleans, East Ham area. Leeds? Orleans. Sorry. Oh, Orleans. Yeah, headed out that area. I go, am I going to have to learn how to understand that kind of yeah. accent when I get up there? <laughs> 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 but the um, going all the way out towards that area. Um, Orleans, like New Orleans, but And Wellfleet. And um, I like that section of the Cape. Okay. Race Point. Uh, there's a lot of different areas around there. It's really beautiful. I'm excited. It looks gorgeous. So. And what I like to do on the Cape is mix in the marine mammals. So they have really good whale watches out oh. of Provincetown, which goes out to uh, Stellwagen Bank National Wildlife Refuge. Okay. So when you're on the tip of the Cape 
in the race point area. Uh-huh. Um, you, most whale watches are like four or five hours long, but you'll spend an hour going out to the whales and an hour back. Okay. When you're at race point, you could see a whale five minutes on the boat. We saw whales from shore and before we even get on the boat. Rays are? Well, race, R-A-C-E, point. R-A-C-E, like a race. Yeah. Okay. And then there's different areas, like when you go farther out to the tip of the cape. But any, and then I like doing, um, there's several uh, boat tour companies that go out to, um, to see seals. So I find that a lot of fun, photographing saw, the seals. I saw one seal. Where, where, where did I go this year? Oh, to Ireland, in Northern Ireland. We were like, one seal. I saw one seal. And you know what I did? I went, look, a manatee. <laughs> And then I realized they don't have manatees in Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> the seals are a lot easier to see than manatees. Manatees stay pretty close under the water, so. I know, I love the manatees. All right, so where are we going in July? Since you're taking me around the United States I'm month still by on month. The, I'm still <laughs> on the New England coast. And then August is one of my favorite times of year. Oh. I'm off to Alaska. Okay. So I go out to this... Um, to this section where they have a lot of grizzly bears oh. and then coastal grizzly bears, which where, people call brown bear. Okay, where, where in Alaska is that? It's uh, right out to Katmai National Park. How do you spell that? It's uh, K-A-T-M-A-I. Katmai. National Park. And that's where the grizzlies are and brown bears? Yes. Or are they the same thing? Uh, safe species, coastal grizzlies, some people call them, or brown bears. And they're basically... Once you're out there, I stay at a camp that has like a, um, a floor plane so we could go out to different sections. Okay. So a lot, uh, when you're out photographing a group of bears, you could go from one place to the other. So it could be like, well, I'm, I'm tired of these four or five bears. Let's go to a place where the bears are fishing for salmon. Okay, now let's go to a place where the bears and we have a glacier in the background. Ah. Let's go get the bears in the mud flats. So you, you can you can change that many up bears. your back. And, yeah, it, well, because of our access to a flow plane, uh, so we go out every day by flow plane. Flow plane is a like where it can land on the water, and then uh, go out and, and photograph different areas of Alaska. Wow, because that's why Alaska is so special. And then when I come back, I do another tour in in Greater Anchorage, like within the three or four hours of Anchorage. Okay. And Anchorage is a beautiful city, but as soon as you get about 10, 20 miles out of the city, you're in total wilderness. So there's a lot of great boat tours and marine mammal tours. And then I do like a private boat where you can go out and see like, you could get stellar sea lions, bald eagles, sea otters, tufted puffin, and all kinds of birds, humpback whales, orcas. What's so special all about the that puffins city. that everybody wants to photograph puffins? I think it's just, uh, they're just such a beautiful bird with interesting behavior. And they're the closest relative to penguins. So usually it somewhat reminds people of penguins. Okay, because I know everybody has a puffin trip, it seems. Like, I'm like, I'm looking at the picture going, I mean, it's okay, but what's the they're big deal? About this big. <laughs> they're, I like the nickname for them. Their nickname is sea parrots. Sea parrot, yeah. And I, and I just think it kind of shows I get it. it. And it, it's like, you know, barring owls. It's, oh. uh, they're cute so they're the, the cutest world. owls, owls <laughs> in the whole world. I never get tired of photograph of them. Now let me just tell you, I can say that for the best time for the burrowing owls here in Florida anyway, is probably May, because that's when they have the babies. And Correct. So that's when we do, well we do one in March and one in May, we do day trips, you know, with the van, got the, bought the van and um, go do burrowing owls, because especially when the babies are there, they're so cute, they're so cute even when they're not babies, but when they're babies, they're just they must be great. Oh. Uh, when, I'm, when I do my tour in February, we don't have the babies. No. I always wish we did. They're not, they don't come till late it, April. Exactly. May. Yeah, yeah. And that's when all, everybody, everybody's already gone by then for us. That's yeah, when the, the all the snowbirds are gone. So <laughs> just the locals. And that must be a good time if you're, not a, or if you're a resident after the end. Well, of, it depends. You know, it's a good time if you want to go. Do, there's not very much traffic. You can go out to eat. You have all that kind of stuff. You just can't afford to do anything because there's no money. Because <laughs> all the <laughs> people with the money left. <laughs> They're only here for the winter, you know. 
it's it's you have to be if you want to live in a seasonal area you have to be really good at saving your money because you got to make it six months without much money coming in you know yeah so that's a long time <laughs> i can imagine <laughs> that's why we work 100 hours a week during seasons so. you want to talk about a short seasonal uh place like in alaska oh what's theirs yeah they, they get most of their people from july to, to first week of september Wow, Their whole tourist is, season's about two months. That is short, but you don't go during, well, you go in the shoulder season. <laughs> well, not so much. I'm there at the peak in August, but um, well, there's so many wild places. You can, it's you just can so go big. places that you wouldn't see anybody from. How big month. is Alaska? I it's, mean, it's the it's biggest huge. state we have. So. Yeah, it's, it's beyond huge. I think it's two and a half times the size of Texas. And Texas is huge. Yeah. <laughs> it's, but it's special. I mean, with all the different biodiversity and the mammals and oh. the northern lights and the whales. And I can't get enough of that place. All right. So July, August, September. September's a shoulder season for up north somewhere. Right. That's a, uh, that's a great time to get um, some of the northern places. If When it gets into... I just want to mention October for a minute. October is peak foliage, uh -huh. but for somebody who wants to avoid the October crowds and have a little bit of early fall, September is nice. And then like if you're in Maine, yes, because it's not going to be turning yet in, you, in Massachusetts, is no. it? No, and I'll tell you about the peak of each thing. But um, for me, I get six weeks of peak foliage, and the way I get six weeks is I'm in I'm in Yellowstone to Grand Tetons in September. And I got to tell you, the Grand Tetons is just as good as Yellowstone See, for no, wildlife, for landscapes. I don't think about them for though for most people don't color for no, the, fall. Yeah, you even it's even better than Yellowstone for fall. Color. Really? Because that's where you can get a nice reflection and a oh. snow-capped mountain in the background and oh, things like that. Oh yeah. And then when you and then in October, is by the time I leave Yellowstone, I get back into New England, and the first week of October is usually peak uh, for, nor for Northern Maine and New Hampshire and Vermont. Okay. So that's when you want to be there. And then coastal New England, even if you go farther north, because of the ocean breeze, it regulates the temperature. Okay. So Acadia gets a, a mid-October fall foliage. Oh, interesting. So I go to the White Mountains and play around a lot in Maine and Rangeley, Maine and different areas like that, which Maine has several fall foliage destinations. In New England, uh, fall foliage is a billion dollar business with the with the tourist economy. Oh my god! It's a big time of year. That's where I think of if you want to see fall foliage, and I'm from Michigan, we've got beautiful foliage there, but you think about going to Maine <laughs> for yeah, some reason. Yeah, I'm sure the Upper Peninsula is phenomenal, <laughs> but I've never been there. But the um, but yeah, so we uh, we get the peak the first week of October, and then and then on the coast of Maine, it goes into week two or three, and then Massachusetts is southern New England. They usually get it around the middle of the month in October, okay. so I play around a little bit in there, and then I go down to um, for late October. I go back to the Smokies, and that's oh, yeah, peak of the Smokies. And that's how I'm lucky enough to get six, six weeks, weeks of, of foliage. That's so cool. So now let me just tell you about here in September. August and September are probably the best months if you want those Clyde Butcher kind of pictures with the big clouds. Yeah, because I Because that's when it rains the most, and it's just gorgeous here. It is so beautiful. The sunsets are to die for. And if you like to go in the, out the Everglades and get the pretty clouds and that kind of stuff, that would be the time of year to come. Nobody comes here either. Nobody comes to South Florida in, in August and September, so it's nice and quiet here too. Everybody's set in their ways. It's, there's always like there's almost like a blueprint yeah, that exactly. you have to follow. I know. And the people that don't listen to the blueprint really get the best shots. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So now you may as well get me, get me to the end of the year now. <laughs> the, uh, so what am I going to do in November? <laughs> November, I like two different places. Okay. Um, I personally like going to the Southwest. And the reason is, is you're out of tourist season. Now Southwest being where? Um, Arizona and Utah. Okay. So you could go into Zion, Bryce, Arches, Canyonlands, Sedona, Grand Canyon, and um, a bunch of places like that. And it's the off season. 
So I'm looking at hotels that might be two, three hundred dollars a night, and it's seventy nine dollars. Okay. And then we the, love that. And the crowds are gone, and um, and it and it's just a wonderful Is time. Is it cold though? Or? Average temperature, I would say seventy five. That's beautiful. I know. I I don't understand Especially why. Especially if you're lugging heavy camera gear or something, right? Exactly, because that stuff gets really heavy. <laughs> so, and it, it's just a wonderful time. So, like, bef when I do a tour, it takes me years of research. Okay. Like, in my house, I have, like, seven or eight bookshelves that are taller than me of all books. Uh-huh. And I'm on the internet researching things and contacting people. And, like, I've been going to Southwest for the last four years. If I ever really offered it as a tour, I mean, I want to make sure that I know it inside out. Wow. Which you never you. could for that big of an no. area, but as much as I can. Right. And right. then, um, but I would recommend anybody consider the Southwest in November and it's, it, or April and May. And also the winter. Um, if you look at a place like Bryce Canyon or Arches mm -hmm. and put a little snow over the arch or in Bryce Canyon, you could actually get snow in some of the pitches and it's pretty phenomenal. Oh, yeah. So the. Um, and the southwest, I personally don't like the heat, so I wouldn't want to be there in June, July, August, or September. I or went to New Mexico in May, the end of May, early June, because I was in southern New Mexico in early, or end of May, and then early June. I was going back, but I came back, I went Route 66. Oh, that would be fun. northern, and I stayed in Albuquerque and then Santa Fe for, I was there three days. That place is really cool. All of New Mexico. I never knew New Mexico was so cool. But that was a good time of year to go. It wasn't too hot. Yeah. It was beautiful. It's such a great place, like, going out there. i gotta, I got to be totally honest. Before I went to the Southwest, in my mind, it was just a big sand pit. Ah. And then when you actually go and experience all these different things. That's how I thought of New Mexico. Well, I didn't know. My brother lived in New Mexico. I never even visited him. What a rotten sister. <laughs> and my mother went out there, and she was like, oh, it's just, you know, land and land and land. And so I thought it was going to be just flat and, like you said, like kind of deserty. And Yeah. It's but just there's mountains. There's mountains <laughs> and arches and And, and then we rock. went to White Sands National Park, which oh, was amazing. That's and really unique. So, yeah, it was cool. And the red the red rocks with the deep red, it it's was, just fascinating. It was beautiful. All right, so now I'm in December now. Now you got to take me through the whole year. <laughs> <laughs> what? De December, I like, um, you could go to the southwest. Is, uh, you get the cooler temperatures, um, probably not in the height of tourist season, and then a little bit of possibly snow. And then, but uh, what I do personally, I go on the, what they call the Delmarva Peninsula. Where's which that? is Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia coastline. It's cold there. It is. So what? Why do you go? Not freezing cold, but it's it is cold. So We're, why do you go there then? I like the combination of things that are going on. Okay. Like there's wild horses in Maryland and Virginia, and then I go and photograph them. And but what they're they're around year round, but the the migrations going on for snow geese, so I could go in and see. Thousands of snow geese all take it off at once. Oh, that'd be and cool. And it sounds like a plane's taking off. And then, um, and then the crowds are going, and it's, it's considered the off-season. Where do you see the horses? Um, Chincoteague National Wildlife Refuge and also Assateague Island. And Chincoteague, do, that's where they, they drive the horses through the water or something? They could. It, um, Why every do they year, do that? If, if the population doesn't get... Um, if the population gets too high, they they do do a horse drive where they move off the island. Oh, is that what's going on? Yeah, and it's a popular event because you see thousands of people watching. I but they don't do it every year. They do, uh, and, and I think it's in the summer. Yeah, and, I think it's in the summer. Too. And I've never been, but I was warned several times don't because it's it, so crowded. It, it's unbelievable. You have a little island that's like literally a thousand times its normal capacity. But you go there in the winter. Yes. Because it's beautiful. And beautiful beaches. Is it hard to find the wild horses? No, it's actually pretty easy. Because yeah. here, you know, here in Gainesville, Florida, which is about, I don't know, five or six hours north of here, they have wild horses at pra Payne's Prairie. Prairie, but I've never seen them. I haven't either, but I've been there for Did a Did you see that video that was all over Facebook? A horse was attacking an alligator? No, that I was love so to cool. see that. That was so cool. I would love to get on my website like a, a page of all these interesting animal clips. 
Okay. And just put it out there because there's so many good If I can find videos. that, I'll send it to you. Because it was it like, was. oh my God, I know that spot, but I never saw a horse. And I guess the horse just thought the alligator was getting too close to his family or something and just attacked it. <laughs> yeah, the, it, the wild horses are kind of interesting. There's, uh, there's also places like in North South Carolina where they're out on the barrier islands. And I don't know much about that. Are the but. landscapes pretty with the horses there? Or? Yeah, it's really nice. Because the landscape on, in Payne's Prairie for horses is kind of boring, you know? And they've got the bison there, too. It, and also around greater Yellowstone, I always get impressed by the side trips you can do. Okay. It's like, for instance, the Yellowstone Tetons, you can take a side trip out and go down the, um, the Beartooth Highway. You can do a side trip for horses. There's a side trip for ghost towns. There's a side trip for prairie dogs. I love ghost towns. Yeah, I do too. That's <laughs> what I've been doing lately is uh, visit some of those places. That's so cool. So the the bottom line in the U.S. is an infinite number of places no to go. No kidding. So when when somebody asks me why I don't go internationally. Why should you? I, that, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have places I haven't been in the U.S., are you kidding? How could you possibly be everywhere in the U.S.? It's so huge. And it's just, it's just amazing. That is, that is amazing. There's always a new place and a new hotspot. For me, adventure. all of our photo trips are things we fell into. You know, like I had a friend who owned a hotel in St. Croix. So we were doing photo trips to St. Croix. I love St. Croix. That's U.S. But he sold the hotel, and then, of course, they really got hit by the hurricane. So probably we won't be going back to... And then I sort of fell into Cuba. And, you know, it's like... We just sort of, because mostly we do stuff here in Florida. This is, like we like you said, we know this area, so this is where we kind of stay. Yeah, just, I don't blame you. I mean, there's so many incredible places. It's so gorgeous here. I, I just love it. Even, um, there's, a, there's a lot of great spots just to photograph in Naples alone. I mean, I have a beautiful studio, and then uh, the crew wetlands. Uh, one another. Although everything's closed right now because of the hurricane, the bird rick or the yeah bird rickery is from crew and that's closed. Yes, yeah. corkscrew most you know half the boardwalks closed and. And what advice I would have for somebody photographing Florida and obviously you would know from being here is um, Florida can really change depending on the water level. So if the water level is high your usual spot might not be good. Exactly. And if, the, and if there's an extensive drought, on the other hand, I mean, your I bet you clock spot. Spot <laughs> yeah. see that look like a prairie with um, no water. Did you have to do a lot of Plan B stuff on this trip? Jeff? Yes. And a lot we did. Joe, you know, Joe does his Everglades, and he was like, well, I got it. He, he had to spend the whole week, the week before, scouting because his usual spots were all... You know, for birds, because the birds, you can't, they're, they're too wet, so they went farther north. I can usually tell the change of weather just by the plane landing and looking out the window. Oh, you can see this. Because I fly to Fort Myers Airport. Oh, okay. And you can be like, that, that pond shouldn't be there. <laughs> and then you, can't, you know right it's away. It's not a pond. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a flood. <laughs> exactly. And then the, um, but it's really important for Florida to be really on top of the way, I mean, the, the, the tides and also the water levels. Now I'm just, I just looked at the time, so it's, man, that, that was the fastest hour ever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I didn't even ask you, like, hardly anything on the little teleprompter. <laughs> well, you kind of guided us through the whole year, though. It was awesome. It was fun. It was, uh, this, uh, the bottom line is there's a lot of great places. And I love your studio. I love the the things you do here and keep thank up the great you. work. Well, thank you. Now, where can where can we find you? What's your website? And hey, uh, my website is sphotography.com. S, for S Slonine. Like it's, yes, S Slonina. Like, yeah, nobody remembers my last name because it's hard. It's Slonina. hard. Yeah. Is that Italian? No, it's Polish. But, oh, um, they must have. That's not a Polish name. They must have. <laughs> right? Did they do something to it? There's that's no a whole C story in itself. But, <laughs> but it. it but I, I got a good URL with the S, S photography. photography. Do, dot com. That's awesome. Because it, otherwise nobody would remember. That's the easiest one ever to remember. S, it, photo S like Sam. S photography dot com. And every every time I get introduced to be a speaker at a photo conference, very few people get it right. The so, name. Yeah, your name. Exactly. I know. Well, I messed it up last week on the show, <laughs> so <laughs> I can relate to that. <laughs> and now what's your next trip? 
My next ship is um, off to, in a few weeks, off to Alaska. And is that sold out? Uh, yes. What's, Actually, for the next two years. What's the next trip that you have openings for? I believe uh, Yellowstone in May, Ooh. which is a really nice area. Time, it's the spring with the baby bears and all that. Okay. It's a great time to see the bears. All right. And, and we might have a little snow on the ground, so it makes for some good landscapes. And that's on your website, right? Yes. Okay. So S S S photography dot com. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. And um, just remember also to check the show notes on our site on understandphotography.com. Heather does a good job. She takes notes and she types them all up for you guys so that she can look at them there. We embed the YouTube video right onto our um, website, although we really, right now we're on a kick to try to get YouTube subscribers. So it's better for us if you go onto YouTube, watch us there so you can hit that little subscribe button. And when you subscribe, what they do is they just send you a little push notification. That's just a tiny little... I mean, it's kind of like a pop-up, but it's really small on the bottom of your screen. It just says new episode of Understand Photography or something like that. So um, that's what happens when you subscribe to our channel. You don't get emails or anything like that. I don't think you get emails anyway. No, no emails. Okay. Um, next week on the Understand Photography Show, my guest is going to be Isaac Hadid from Southern Photo Technical Service. Uh, uh, Southern Photo is the camera repair store here in Florida, basically. He's in Miami, which is a couple hours away, but he's, uh, he's the big guy in Florida. And we're going to talk about focus issues more than anything, because a lot of people have trouble focusing. So that's kind of going to be the, the theme of our show. So tune in here on the Understand Photography Facebook page at 4 p.m. Eastern Time if you want to watch us live on Friday. Or, again, you can watch the recording on YouTube or listen on iTunes. I'm Peggy Farron. Thank you so much for watching episode number 75 of the Understand Photography Show. Thank you, John Slonina. Slonina. <laughs> for being my guest. <laughs> and we'll see you next week. Thank you for watching the Understand Photography Show. It would help us immensely if you would click like and subscribe to our YouTube channel.